you're blonde, you're not technical, that it would just be a disaster. And so I, I sort of said to this friend who said it to me, I, I said, well, where can I go to learn? This, this, this isn't right. And I can't be the only person like this. And he said, look, I, I actually went to this group in the UK called First Tuesday. Hey, everybody. Today I'm speaking with Kendra Ross. Kendra describes herself as an entrepreneur, a dyslexic thinker. She's a top 20 cybersecurity influencer and a community and ecosystem strategist. She loves building things. And whether it's companies at scale or new communities and ecosystems, she's successfully built, exited, and created outstanding results in all those areas. And she's now taking this knowledge and turning that into helping others build things as well. As you'll see from the interview, Kendra's one of those person who likes to create, likes to paint outside the lines, creating and innovating in areas that haven't seen change for years. In the interview today, we chat about her and her background. Um, we also talk about building businesses and governance. And then lastly, we have a chat into you know, some of the ecosystems that she has built and how and why she created those. I hope you enjoy the interview. Kendra, how are you? I'm actually really good, thanks, Hilary. I'm, um, yeah, the sun is shining in Wellington. Uh, I've got my daughter home from uni. Uh, getting to spend a lot of time with my family because we're level four lockdown, well, now three. Um, and I'm sort of one of those people that always looks at things in a positive light. So having time with my family is um, really lovely and I'm making the most of, of that. So I'm, I'm good. How are you? Oh, good. Yeah, I'm very good as well. I'm having some of that intense family time as well <laughs> um, with my kids, which are quite a bit younger mm. than yours. So that's kind of, you know, not without its challenges, but it's it's a really unique situation and it's a situation that we're all um, connected by as well. So like you say, you got mm. to take the positives out of it for sure. Yeah, yeah. Shared experience, you know, that not often lots of diverse people have such a a shared common experience that they can rally together on. Um, so that's right, you know, that's, and, a, and a global one positive. at that as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, feeling really fortunate to be here in New Zealand. Yeah. Oh well, I'm so excited to to speak to you today, and thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, I think it'd be really helpful just for our audience, maybe if you you know talk a bit about your background and yourself, um, just to give them a bit of context. That'd be really cool. Yeah, sure. Um, kia ora to everyone who's listening and, and joining. Uh, really privileged to be actually invited on today. So thanks, Hells. It's awesome. No, not at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I, look, I, I've got a very traditional Kiwi background in terms of the way I grew up. Very middle class family, very outdoorsy, fortunate, had a family farm that we could go to for holidays. Um, all of that sort of stuff, playing, you know, out in the street. It was a real outdoorsy, sporty sort of background. Uh, both of my parents actually were in business uh, at various times themselves, and I think that's been an incredible role model. My mum was a hairdresser and had her own salon, which she sold before I was sort of three. And, um, you know, she's one of these um, battlers. They didn't give loans to people at you know, females yeah. back then. And so she had to get friends and family to, to finance her. So, you know, I, I guess uh, my parents have got a, a huge work ethic and that's come through uh, in, in what I saw and, and now replicate myself. I, I had a really hard time at school, really hard. Um, yeah. And it wasn't until I actually had an accident when I was nine, I broke my elbow, shattered it, and I was in and out of hospital for a couple of years. And you know, at that stage, the teachers used to say to my mum and dad that, you know, she seems like really intelligent. And we think she's just really lazy. And, oh, um, okay. you know, they just make me work harder. And um, it was just really hard. And then uh, mum read this article in a magazine in a waiting room in the hospital, which was about this woman, this American living here in Wellington. And she um, she was actually trained in assessing people for dyslexia. And she described it. And it was like a massive eureka moment for my mother and she's like my god that's that sounds like Kendra so um she's slightly stalkerish 
track this woman down and knocked on her door in her apartment in Oriental Bay and arranged for me to have an assessment and sure enough that's that was it I, I was dyslexic and you know it's one thing to give a label and a name but then you know you start mm. this big long journey to to you know overcome those challenges or put support around you and um you know it, it, schooling was really hard it wasn't my thing per se which is where I sort of found myself in sport a lot um, but I struggled through and I got lots of support. Um, you know, the other thing just in context of background um, before I hit the workforce was I did Rotary Exchange in 84. Okay. And I was 17, really naive, came out of a, a very multicultural school and went to South Africa. And it wow. was still, okay. yeah, it was, you know, still apartheid um, yes. uh, era, went into a school that was, um, I came from a single set school, girls, and this was 600 guys, 200 girls. We had two Japanese who were considered to be honorary white. Um, it was just a real headspin for me because it just, you know, was so different to what I'd experienced and, and just so wrong on so many levels. Um, mm. But it was, you know, I bounced around four families who all four of them were highly religious and I came from a non-religious background. Um, not all of them were racist. Um, there were some families there that that really were trying to um, to change, but you know, it's just it was just an eye opening experience for me um, over there, and I learnt a lot of resilience during that time. And you know, there were bombs that went off about thirty k from us, and wow. you know, it was it was quite terrifying for my parents, and you know, while I was there for that year. But I just, yeah, I. I learned a lot about myself and um, I got tougher and, um, and a lot more resilient and I learned about managing stress. I actually ended up with alopecia and losing my hair through the stress. So, you know, I had to learn a lot about that. Um, and I bounced back to New Zealand quite a different person and gung-ho, raced into university. I was going to be the first one from my family to get a degree. And um, I pretty quickly found out that university and me didn't really um, agree. Um, I'm very much a hands-on doer, learn by doing, and um, I found sitting in classroom after classroom and also it being self-learned. Learning was really hard for me, um, and I actually my part-time job, which was I'd always had part-time jobs all through school and, and everything, and at the, um, Palmy, it was at a radio station, and um, it went from sort of 15 hours, yeah, <laughs> um, doing community notices and um, driver and errand girl. But it, it just sort of grew to 20 hours and then 30 hours. And before I knew it, I was at 40 hours and not going to, to uni at all. Um, so I, I, I dropped out and came back to Wellington with my tail between my legs and um, ate humble pie with my parents and moved back in there, <laughs> which I never thought I was going to do. And, you know, and then they said, well, you've got to go get a job now and um, I, I just took the first job I could get and interesting enough when I talked to a lot of female leaders in IT around my era most of us never set out to work in IT we oh. all just fell into it uh, whether we went in through customer service or through um, PAs and typists and, and sales support type things that's the, the majority in my generation and that's exactly what happened to me and I went to work for Epson and that started my journey in IT and I went from sales support to marketing to, to sales to management and um, one day an opportunity came up to start our own business and um, we looked around and my business partner had just started a family and I wanted to start, start a family and you know I always knew I was going to have my own business it was just a case of um, what not really when and for me opportunity came up to do distribution which is what we'd been doing together at uh, a company called Malco and so yeah so we quite naively raced into setting up our own business not a lot of resources uh, started with a book which I still to this day recommend to people who are actually starting a business called the e-myth revisited and right yep brilliant it's such a good foundation book in terms of setting up systems and processes for a business so um yeah so we raced in and, and fast forward you know we've had our ups and downs through that time 
we've just about lost the business in 2007, 2008. Um, we had to let all our staff go. We part it back to, to just three. Um, we just spent weeks thinking that we were going to lose our homes, probably one of the worst times of my life. Yeah. Um, but learned an extraordinary amount through that process. And um, we had to change our business and we had to change it quickly. And that's how we got into cybersecurity. We made one slight change to our product range and saw an opportunity and, and then just grew to the point that we sort of ended up being the largest distributor in New Zealand in that space over, you know, over a short period of time. Uh, and we exited the business in 2019 and we had three businesses at that stage, one in Australia, two here, two in cybersecurity. And so, yeah, here I am now sitting in front of you. Um, not quite sure what my next chapter is, but that's sort of my journey to where I got to. Wow, yeah. that is a completely fascinating journey. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't <laughs> expecting all of that. Oh my goodness! Um, and I guess there's, you know, in terms of dealing with adversity, that's that's been a bit of a, a common thread, I guess, through some mm. of that as well, like dealing with learning difficulties and then going to South Africa. What what made you decide at seventeen that that mm. was kind of the next step? Because yeah, yeah, <laughs> why South Africa? Yeah. Um, a couple of reasons, actually. Um, the first one was that uh, in 81, there'd been the Springbok tour of New Zealand, and uh, it was so divisive. You know, I came from a, a, a real sporting family. I uh, had an uncle who was in All Black just, you know, not long before that. One of my uncles was refereeing uh, the test matches. You know, my dad had played provincial. It was just, it was part of our DNA. And so... You know, for us, there was just no question that we were going to go to the rugby. And then we went to the rugby and we we went with my grandfather and uh, and grandmother and we actually had to walk, we had to park a long way away and walk because there were barricades. And those barricades, you know, were these people that were feeling really passionate that the Springbok shouldn't be here. And I, I guess I was sort of, you know, uh, what, 14 at the time and um we had to take a side road to try and get around them and they knew that we were coming and so they rushed up in vehicles to block that way and my grandfather actually got hit during that time he was fine it, 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 just a, a, a knock and, and knocked him over but it was just you know my parents dug in really strongly feeling that this was wrong that they shouldn't be protesting and but for me it was sort of well why what are what are they protecting what are they protesting what don't I understand so you know that sort of sparked an interest in the country for me because we had to grow up with so many freedoms and and I realized that diversity is still an issue across culture mm. but you know we were in a better position than them and you know so that was sort of the first reason the second reason was everybody wanted to go to the States and I just don't like doing what everybody else wants to do. <laughs> so, and that I didn't sense. think, yeah, and I didn't want to go somewhere where I really had to learn the language because um, I just thought that would be too hard. So, yeah, so they it's those were the two reasons, well. yeah, and I yeah. ended up there um, and I'm incredibly grateful that I did, yes. um, yeah. And we were the last year to go, actually. So they stopped it to South Africa after us right. because it had become too dangerous after yep. after that. Yeah. And mm. and in terms of you getting into tech um, and cyber as well, um, you know, you sort of said you fell fell into that. But once you got into it, like how did you what was how did you learn, you know, IT, mm. technology, cyber? Like what was your process? Just for people who kind of think, oh no, that's you know, I don't know what that can look like. Can you explain mm. that for you? Yeah, yeah. I, it's it's really interesting because you know you hear tech and you think that it's all this really um, you know it's either engineering and you're pulling bits of pieces together and motherboards and plugging stuff in or it's coding and you know there, there's just so many different pathways in tech you know from even sales to to marketing to you know what you're doing Hillary and your role you know in leadership. <laughs> and leadership yeah that's right you know and and psychology of of um, you know, cyber threats is, is fascinating and really interesting. I, I, um, I, you know, I guess because of that dyslexic brain and the processing, I am a, a, a little bit of a, um, 
hands-on type person and I do like to play with things but I'm not I wouldn't call myself a geek but I love gadgets I absolutely adore gadgets and you know as soon as something comes out I'll be the first one lining up to buy it um, um I'm easily sold to with that sort of stuff <laughs> yeah you know, so they sort of see me coming you know before I've even got in the shop and they go ah. so there's an innate interest there <laughs> there's, yeah. there's yeah we're going to be able to sell something to her and we're going to sell all the accessories that go with it too it must be stamped on my forehead or something <laughs> <laughs> but, but um you know I with um the technology stuff when I started to to dive into it and learn about it um I actually found that I understood it and the more I read and the more I actually played with things you know really simple stuff the more it all sort of started to come together and and the puzzle and it's like anything um the more effort and work you put into something the more you're always going to do better at it you know and the elite athlete doesn't get there just by talent it's the hard work that they put in so you know um back in the day when i was doing this we we didn't have podcasts to to listen to per se but we you know we we certainly had um articles that we could read and books that we could read and for me it was people that i could talk to so we decided to do this thing called cyber security uh which back then actually you know wasn't called that it was um, no. information information security <laughs> security yeah because yeah, we were just worrying about information um and so i did go looking for a group that i could actually learn about this because it, it did really interest me and i um went out and i went to ISACA, it's you know it's very much around risk and governance and you know they had security in the in the title so I thought this will be awesome and but it wasn't it was really boring and it was very risk and governance sort of structure nothing around the the meaty bit which I wanted and so then I went to um, look at ISIG uh, and I talked to a few people and they said look you you know you're not technical enough you would just be eaten alive in that group it's it's all males there's no females you know you're you're blonde you're not technical it would just be a disaster and so I, I sort of said to this friend who said it to me I, I said well where can I go to learn this just this isn't right and I can't be the only person like this and he said look I, I actually went to this group in the UK called First Tuesday and it was a meetup for senior security professionals and it you know it was run by this guy Ian he was a recruiter but there was a no sales policy and um, I said, well, that sounds great. Well, how, how do we do something like that? And he said, well, look, let's get on a call with Ian and see how he feels about us sort of setting up a group like his and, and taking his IP uh, effectively. And so we, we put a call into him in London and, and he was like, well, as long as it's not commercial, I'm, I'm happy for you to, um, to take the name and, and build it. And so Paul uh, Hortop and I actually set out to do that. Uh, it was 2000 and eight and um, we started with about 12 people that we knew in a bar and it was just informal but we got people in to give a presentation and so for me it was actually creating a vehicle for me to learn you um, built your own selfishly community. <laughs> built my own community <laughs> so, you so, could I, learn from them. so I could learn and you know and it's, it's you know it's it. it's it, it, I think someone built a razor, didn't they? It's the same sort of thing, you know, because they, they wanted a particular product. We all do this because we're yeah. solving a problem. And that was the problem. There was nowhere for me to go. And I can't have been the only one like that. So, um, yeah, it's grown from strength to strength. We're sort of over 900 members right. across New Zealand, um, runs monthly in Wellington, bi-monthly Auckland and you know a little bit ad hoc in Christchurch but we're we're getting there <laughs> we um, will get there we will we're going to we do will. one before lockdowns but yeah <laughs> was we'll exactly there. yeah so um so look that you know I find communities and meetups and places like that awesome places to to learn uh went to lots of conferences um you know listened to lots of people um forming ideas and then you know slowly things like your podcast started to come out and we could start to learn that way and I still do I you know dark diaries risky business um and yes, the like yeah. are, you know essential listening for me uh, to keep me current yep. and I follow authors like Brian Krebs and Krebs and um yes. Bruce Shiner and, and the like as well yeah Interesting. yeah and and because you um love sort of technology and gadgets and things like that I'm kind of curious like what what are the top apps on your home screen of your phone 
<laughs> That's such a good question. Oh, um, so look, um, Feedly uh, yes, is probably, yep. yeah, so that's my morning fix with my coffee. I'm reading, you know, my curated feed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, all the feeds that I want to subscribe to, you know, and, and get my fix of news and, and stories and learnings, um, you know, micro learning, quick learning. Um, yeah. <laughs> you're going to laugh at this. Life 360. Um, okay, what's that? So my daughter went to a festival last year uh, when she was 18 called Rhythm and Vines. And so she um, asked for us to load this app up, which effectively still tracks even when your phone is off or out of battery. Um, and I know we're in the world of security and... You're, you're <laughs> tracking her? Yeah, and so she asked us. She asked us to set it up, and she actually sets it up with circles of her friends yeah. when they go out at night as well. Safety. So look, yeah, absolutely. And so weirdly, it continued, and my son joined it, and we now have my mother, my seventy-nine-year-old mother, who lives in another town, on it. Um, I can see when she leaves the house and when she comes back, but it's um, yeah, I don't check it regularly it's just a um if i need to if i'm trying to find yeah. someone um you know if they're not responding to a phone call and it's been really helpful um yeah absolutely so. i mean i have mm. um you know find my iphone and i can see where my husband is <laughs> yeah so yeah. I, I totally get it and I, yeah. I do think about what kind of tracker band do i need to put on my kids you know <laughs> do i need to buy one of those watches yeah. and so no. i i think that that makes yeah. so much sense yeah. yeah, and I, it's yeah. cool to know that there's an app that does it without the phone being, yeah. you know, yeah. on and, you know, the app being on and things like that. That's really cool. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, so yeah, so they're probably my highest usage ones. Fair <laughs> enough. Apart from email, but yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so now, like I, you know, you you sold your business, and um, you know, you're still working in the business. But can you tell me about that kind of next part of your career that you're you're in now? Um, I know you recently made some changes from working inside the business to working more on advisory boards and, you know, board of executives and things like that. Can you can you tell us about that progression and where you're at? Yeah, now? yeah, sure. Um, so the advisory board stuff sort of started uh, a few years ago. Um, Cert NZ, yeah, you know, um, the acronym for Computer Emergency Response Team. Uh, so I went on to the establishment board for that in an advisory capacity uh, back in 2016, I think it was, August, wow. yeah, and did three and a half years in that capacity. Um, so governments uh, per se or advisory is sort of something relatively new in my career, um, but I think everything that I've done has probably led up to it in, in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, um, having worked in businesses and then built businesses and built teams and, you know, and sort of branding and marketing and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I reached the, the point, you know, I, I, we sold the business in 2019 and um, managed the business and the transition into the organisation, although it's still operating as a standalone unit within uh, sector who brought yes. duo. Yeah. But, um, you know, it was just sort of, it, it, you know, I've fulfilled my my time. And it's one of those cases as well in that uh, progression for other people mean that you sometimes have to get out of the way to allow other people to grow. And in my case, it was to to bring the next level of leaders back up mm. and, and Joe and, and Matt, um, you know, I needed yeah, to get out of their way to do it. And um, so the timing was perfect to, to sort of tap out and let that next generation of leadership sort of come in and, and build to that next stage. So, yeah, so for me, um, they gave it, it was a, it was a huge honour and a privilege. They asked me to come back in and sit on the duo mm. board, yeah. which was um, fantastic that they, you know, still felt that I, uh, could contribute and you know there, there is a desire to take that model into the other countries that they operate in which are in other four countries so um, you know for me the journey hasn't finished with Duo no. which is awesome I'm still you know part of it and part of that story so I'm super yeah. excited about you know even with the challenges of COVID what we're going to be able to do uh, with the business yeah. and it does continue to grow and, and I'm fascinated also on seeing 
the new leadership decisions coming through and influencing and changing some of the business. Um, you know, it's it's great. That is a very really cool company. Cool. Yeah, mm. it's super cool. And um, yeah, and so it's, yeah, so I'm still connected, which is lovely. Um, you know, and I'm about to sort of move on to a couple of other um, boards and full governance um, roles. And I'm actually doing, <laughs> Yay. we'll see, we'll see, I'm doing the Institute of Directors course down in Queenstown in oh, fabulous. October. If we're at um, level two, I'm, I'm hopeful that they'll still run it. So, yeah, um, and that's just about rounding out some knowledge, you know. Um, yep. For me, you know, I, I, there's aspects of the governance side that I, I still don't um, know. And, um, you know, this will give me an opportunity to sort of round that out for me. So I'm, I'm super looking forward to, to learning that. But, uh, you know, I, I just, in terms of board and governance, I, I guess I, I bring a different element to um, a lot. You you know this, Hilary, in terms of, you know, every business now is truly a technology company. Absolutely, yeah. You know, whether you're a florist or a plumber, it doesn't matter. You, you're using technology now to deliver your, your service. And, you know, even at enterprise level with the banks, and I look at the boards and they still have a traditional makeup, you know, of, of an accountant style and a, and a, you know, a risk officer and someone with marketing experience. And, you know, and all of the, the old foundational legal, um, you know, but they don't have technologists on the boards and, and uh, you know, and it's just <clears throat> they're technology companies and they need to have that voice. And cybersecurity is a subset of that and it's just, as you know and I know, it's so important now to incorporate cybersecurity into your business. And, and so I'm, you know, I'm really looking forward to being able to actually help some companies on that journey and, and um, add, add a voice in that space. Well, they will be very lucky to have you, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I completely yeah. agree. We need we need more people with technology skills on boards. And, and I'm, I'm actually disappointed with the, even when you look at the, the different board positions that come through, the lack of um, specifications for that even now. So, um, mm. I mean, I know that's changing, um, but yeah, it's, yeah. Mm. It's slowly yeah. going. <laughs> it is, it is. And it's just, you know, if you want to be um, in a growth mindset for a business, you know, you're going to have yeah. to mix it up and diversify that that board makeup. Uh, it's just critical to, to, you know, future success for companies. So, yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Cool. Um, so we've talked about some of the community building that you've done, and one of those community communities is the the ISANS awards that you you've developed. I um, can you tell people what that is? Can you and also then talk us through like why you decided to do it, but also how like how did you go about yeah. building that amazing community? Yeah, uh, yeah. So um, ISANS Information Security Awards for New Zealand uh, about to it's open now. Entries for um, businesses in New Zealand. It's um, just uh, actually we're in our seventh year. We we did have wow. to postpone last year uh, due oh, to COVID, right. unfortunately. But we're we're back this year and we're we're in November. So we're really hopeful that we'll be running um, a live event. Um, but we, we came about because um, one of those conferences that I regularly attended was over on the Gold Coast, um, OSCERT. And at OSCERT, they had the um, SC magazine would um, hold its annual awards for Australia and New Zealand. And I one year I was actually over and I was supporting a friend of mine who worked for GCSB and they had actually um, created some voluntary standards for SCADA systems in New Zealand and written the standards and had entered the awards with these standards as an initiative and they were finalists. So we were um, sitting around the table at the awards and um, there was another Kiwi company, I can't for the life of me remember who it was now, also there um, and the finalists and I just sort of sat there and I thought, this is really sad that we have to come to Australia to get recognised for the great work that we're doing in New Zealand. And so a few drinks that night said to a few of the people at the table, we should be doing this in New Zealand, we should create this ourselves. And, um, you know, they all went, yeah, let's do it. And so from there we, you know, roped in a few more people and tried to sort of cover different aspects of the industry from technical through to sort of government through to you know the sales um, side of things so that we 
could touch every part of, of the industry in New Zealand and, um, and built the awards. And when you say, how did you build them? Well, it was, you know, it was a little bit of a lot of searching on Google. <laughs> How do you how do you build an awards? And um, fortunately, though, I'd also at that stage been judging uh, some industry awards, both okay. um, business ones here in Wellington and also um, uh, uh, tech awards as well. And so I had a, a bit of a judging hat on and I could understand around criteria and things like that. And so collectively, we came up with the, the first sort of set of awards that we thought were right to to fit the market at that particular time. And then uh, we split out the jobs. So someone became head of judges and they had to go find, you know, respected people in the industry that carried weight and were trustworthy and ethical that we could have judging. Um, then we had um, three writing categories and writing the criteria around it. We had someone else who was doing the comms side of things. Um, so much like a business, it's the same sort of concept. You um, you go to your strengths and your skills. So for me, that was around sponsorship. Um, and I took the, the mantle of going out and finding our sponsors that we, you know, we'd priced the event. We knew what we had to charge. We knew um, what we had to pull in to be able to make it actually um, break even. Um, and, um, and so, you know, the first time around was um, so well received because you know there was just this whole community of people oh, yes who, yes yeah, <laughs> yeah we don't have to go overseas we need know. this exactly we need it yeah so you know we need the recognition for new companies and startups it's, it's a chance for them to to build brand I'd, I'd tell anyone yeah. who's in the startup uh, world even any business or, or person awards is your um, your lowest cost of marketing and building brand and mm. um oh, so such a great pr yeah, opportunity yeah it's massive you know and even if you're not the one of just having your name up there as a finalist um you know and the reality yes, is totally that agree. the judges are reading this and the judges are also looking for talent in the market and they earmark people and you know there's all that other aspect of it as well so all their investors you know and they're looking for the next thing so you know so there's yes. there are just so many there's so much value in it so yeah um look we we decided um early on with our awards that it had to be an entertaining night um so yep. we we did things a little bit different in terms of we get a keynote speaker uh, and we've had some incredible, phenomenal keynote speakers over the years, you know, from Dr. Paul Wood, um, you know, uh, psychologist, through to uh, Sir Ian Taylor, who has created an amazing yeah. animation company for sports, you know, um, and, you know, and, and others that have come on. And this year we've got Liam Malone, who's Paralympian, um, oh. and, you know, who's a sprinter, who's, who's lost his legs and runs on blades um, to, to talk about resilience. Um, so, yeah, so we've, yeah, and we have a comedian slash documentary maker. Don't know how they go <laughs> hand in hand. <laughs> Tay Rader, who's our MC, who just always knows how to, um, and that's the other part to running a successful event, is having an MC who knows how to keep everyone on track and keep it moving. You know, a professional. Yes. Yeah, it makes the world a difference, and we're, we're fortunate to get him the first year, and we've had him every year since. So, wow. Yeah, we should be absolutely yeah. so proud of 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 that awards and what a kind of legacy oh, to leave behind. So, the community thanks. building, like, is that a because it's a, a strong you know strength of yours? Is is it a calling? What is it about that? Is it just you you see gaps and you want to fill it um, with the right vehicles? Oh. Do you yeah. have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's just about all of those things uh, in one way or another. Um, uh, back to my parents, huge community service orientated people. So okay. again, started with role models, you know, from school PTAs to and fundraising to the local golf club and everything in the rugby club and you know they were always pitching in working bees and behind bars and fundraising so that that was the the background you know that's what I grew up with and that was what I saw you know and knew um 
you can't be what you don't see you know and and so for me that was that was a big part of it so but yeah it, it's um sometimes it's a frustration i you know i there's 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 something that needs to be done and so i i don't differently sit still. Too. yeah and done differently and um and looking differently um and so that's a that's a big part of it you know the community thing never started out to be about females in tech and it's still not we don't run a specific but we have female leaders running it and and they're at the front and center of it and that in itself is, is super powerful um, and we hear that from females and we have one of the highest attendance uh, in terms of females coming into into our um, first Tuesday and you know we've got another one project Wednesday um, and that was really very much about creating a need for people who were new to cybersecurity and look, you, you guys have been fantastic supporters Cordia, of, of that initiative and that was to give people a place to to come to learn um, for a couple of reasons one we just couldn't actually fit everybody in at first Tuesday uh, and it was changing you know uh, it was becoming more and more interns were coming in and that changed the nature of it so we decided to split it out and by having this one, it, it gave us a, a chance to um, actually structure it a bit differently. So we have, you know, these wonderful hosts who control the evening and we're just the people behind the scenes actually pulling it together. And the hosts get to set the topics and, and set the stage for the, the night. And, you know, and so that keeps it really interesting. And, you know, we've done other things, which is super cool. You know, we're in tech. There's a lot of introverted people who... Yeah. would be terrified to walk into a room you know yet there is so much value because they're meeting future friends future colleagues future employers in these rooms so you know we we need to need them to come in so we um you know we make the offer to um have a buddy or a, a host for the night who will meet them downstairs or outside and and take them in and introduce them around the room and and stay with them um you know and if they need that you know every meeting then we'll do that um as well uh, it's just really important to get them in the room and get, get them comfortable and and see that that anxiety that they're feeling you know can be overcome by yeah you know some simple processes and steps yeah and yeah just absolutely. a bit of understanding mm. yeah that's amazing yeah, so wow. yeah, all of the things you said, Hilary. <laughs> if there's something there, if there's a gap, there's a need, um, you know, if I can't see someone else doing it, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll go, I go build it. it. Mm. <laughs> um, so yeah, we've covered so much. Um, what, what are you next looking forward to, Kendra? Um, what's on the horizon or coming up or anything? Yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, look, I'm I'm in a really quite a different stage. You know, I've got um, one at university, my daughter, my son's going to leave next year, and it's just going to be my husband and I. Um, and that's such a different chapter. But we we're really aligned, my husband and I. It's always about moving forward. Um, life mm. is always about moving forward. You know, look, careers can be a little bit like snakes and ladders. You know, you yeah. go up and then you can go sideways and you can go back. <laughs> Something really bad can happen, um, you know, but you've always just got to keep moving forward. And so for us, that's that's exactly that next stage is, um, you know, and we're just building that out now, trying to work out what that looks like for us. Um, does that look like staying in Wellington? We've built a place up in um, Tauranga. So, you know, it's more than likely we'll head that way for a nice. lifestyle change yeah. yeah um and you know look i'm having some conversations around some investments at the moment with some people um i'm super excited about that uh, but i mm. i just not the sort of person that would park some money and invest in something i i have to also have an involvement and in, and in, in some capacity in some way whether yeah. it's just advisory mentoring or you know or board um, but um, yeah, that's just me. Um, and we've got some ideas bubbling around, and just not sure. Just working through that process, what's actually going to um, work? But probably more of a social enterprise um, next okay. time round. Yep. Uh, and that sort of really excites excites us. So um, yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's a new new so time. Heaps, heaps on then. <laughs> yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. Really exciting. Yeah. I can't wait to see yeah. what these things you're talking about actually end up playing out and, and being so 
That's really Thank cool. You. Yeah, thanks. And so, yeah, any final words for the audience that you'd like to leave people with? You've actually left people with so much just in wow. the content that, of what we've talked about. But any any final ones before we finish up? Wow. Uh, oh, look, at, yeah. There's, um, if you're thinking about whatever you're thinking about doing, leave the fear behind. Um, you know, it's it's it can be um, so challenging for people, and I understand that, but there are so many rewards when you actually take that leap um, and take that jump. And, you know, the, the worst that can ever happen is you fail and that's not the end of the world. You know, um, you learn from that failure and you just come back. You know, I just, you know, I think of those teachers saying that I was dumb effectively. You know, I, I that's a mantra at the back of my head for many years. Um, there's been lots of situations through my career and, and through building a business with people in the background um, don't let those voices be in your head um, you know listen to your gut listen to your instinct and just surround yourself with people who um, bring lift you up and and um, and you lift other people up as well so um, yeah yeah get rid of anyone who's a negative force around you um, and build a, a tribe of people who just will support you and, and help you. Mm, Excellent. And that would be my advice. <laughs> I love it. Mm. Thanks so much, Kendra. Really appreciate oh, it. Thank you. Thanks awesome for the opportunity. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Great chat. It was wonderful. Thanks. Take care.